Hi! This week we will review carbonate rocks, our first type of sedimentary rocks. Hi! This week we will review our first type of sedimentary rocks, the carbonate rocks. And as an introduction, I would like to remind you the different components of a sedimentary rocks, generally speaking, we need to, differ to differentiate the grains here in white from the matrix here in green that are deposited at the same time after an episode of transport from the cement in pink that is crystallizing within the porosity between the grains and the matrix after the deposition. So that's an in-situ precipitation of crystals. In carbonate rocks, the terms are, are, are a bit different. For the grains, we will refer to allochemical grains or allochems um, that are really the equivalent of grains in a classic sedimentary rocks such as sand grains or clay grains. They are making up the skeleton of the rock and in between the rock we can find either a matrix that is a mud, like a micrite, and or a cement that is called a spar in carbonate rock. So alkanes, micrite and spar are really terms that are dedicated to carbonate rocks. For the grains, for those alkanes, we need to, differ to differentiate their nature. They can be either intraclasts, pellets, ooids or skeletal grains, which are little pieces of fossils. Let's start by looking at the micrite that is make, made of microcrystalline calcites. The grain size, the crystal size, ranges between 1 and 4 microns. Whereas for the spar, for the sparry calcite, the cement is usually larger than 10 microns. So in between, between 4 and 10 microns, we have what we call a microspar that is sometimes put pretty hard to uh, it's sometimes pretty hard to differentiate uh, within this boundary to size the grains. In terms of classification of carbonate rocks, there are two main classification schemes, the folk and the dunum. The folk is based on the identification of alkanes and it's commonly used in laboratory because we need to have access to a microscope and eventually a thin section to really make sure we identify and we quantify the different types of alkanes within the sample. Whereas Dunham is based on the texture, the relationship between cement, matrix and grains within the rock and it's ideal for field classification. Let's start with the Folks system. The first thing to define and to look at is the prefix, the first syllable of the name that corresponds to the principal alchem identified in the sample. So for instance, if we identify that in a specimen we have 95% of alkanes that correspond to intraclast, we will use the prefix intra. Similarly, if the main alchem is pellet, we will have we will use pel u for ulit why and bio for biochemical uh, sorry biological fossils then the second syllable corresponds to the material that is between the allochemes and if you remember a couple of slides ago we can have large particles of calcite spar or tiny particles of calcite, micrite. We don't really look at the microsparite here. If we have most of the intraparticle space filled by sparite, we will use the syllable spar. If we have micrites between the alkanes, we will use the syllable mic for the second syllable. And then for the last syllable, the suffix, we will look at the grain size of the allochems. If most of the grains are larger than one millimeter, we will use the suffix rudite. If the allochems have a size 
similar to that of a send, we will use the suffix it. And if we have fine grains, finer than 4 phi, we will use the suffix lutite. So some example here. If we have a carbonate rock that, sorry, in which the principal alchem is intraclasts that are about, well, larger than one millimeter in diameter, and if we can see some spare calcite, spirite in the pore space, we will call that rock intrasparudite. Intra because intraclast is the principal alchem spar because we have some sparite between the alchems and rudite because the, the intraclasts are larger than one millimeter. If we have a new sparite, this is telling us that the main alchem is oid, that between the oids we have sparite and that these oids have the size of a sand particle between uh, 63 and 1 millimeter or 2 millimeters. Okay? And finally, for the biomicrodites, this name is telling us that the principal allochem is biological in nature. This is a, um, a any kind of skeletal grain, some kind of fossils that are uh, embedded uh, within a micrite, so uh, a microcrystalline calcite, and those fossils are fairly large, they uh, are larger than one millimeter, and so we're using uh, the suffix rudite. If we have a biomicrodite or biospirodite or biospirite, anyway, if we have a carbonate rocks where the main principal alchem is a fossil, and if we can identify that fossil, then we can specify that. We could call that rock, for instance, a gastropod biospirodite if uh, most of the fossils are gastropods, or a foram crinoid biomicrite if we have a mixture of foraminifera and crinoid. So there's a bit of leniency here. So this is a figure that summarizes the main type of carbonate rocks and that is giving their folk classification name, so intrasparite for a uh, carbonate rock with intraclast separated by spirite and the grain size um, ranges between 63 and, two mm and 1 millimeter. Um, to the bottom right of the, uh, of, the, of the table, sorry, here we have a pemicrite where we have so pellets as the main constituent, the main alchem separated by micrite and those pellets are fairly small. On the right hand side some um, special cases. If we have no other cams at all, the rock will be called a micrite. This is a mud that has been a carbonate mud that has been lithified. Uh, the grumulus micrite corresponds to a carbonate rock where we have only a mud that has been uh, lithified but within the mud we can see some kind of little um, um, pods of, of different um, texture, of different color. That's uh, what the word grumulus refers to. Uh, this micrite correspond to a micrite that exhibits some pockets of dissolution, some holes that have been filled by spirite. This is what's illustrated by those polygons here on this picture. And finally, the word biolithite correspond to a carbonate rock that has been formed by the precipitation of calcite mediated by living organisms such, such as rifts or stromatolites. Some special considerations, intraclast and oolites to start with. Um, they are very important in terms of um, deposition environment because they correspond to environments where uh, a specific amount of energy was present. So if we have a carbonate rock that has more than 25% of oids or intraclasts, um, and if it has a greater percentage of any other alochemes, we will still refer that rock as a neolithic of intraclastic rock because these in alkanes are telling us a lot of things in terms of depositional environment. Another special consideration, pellets and fossils. 
if we are looking at the ratio between the pellets and um, the biological content, we can come up with a different prefix. So if we have a ratio for of 3 to 1 in favor of pellets, the prefix will be pell. Uh, on the other hand of the spectrum, if we have a dominance of, of biological remains of fossils, we will use the prefix bio. If, you want, if we have a 1 to 1 ratio, we are allowed to use the prefix biopel. And finally, the last special consideration, terrigenous material, detrital material. If we have less than 10% of this material that is coming from nearby land masses, we will not include it in the name, but if we have between 10 and 50% of terrigenous material, we will include it in the name, uh, and we will specify whether it's a sand, a silt, or a clay-sized material. And that's an example here. On the last line of the slide, we could call such a rock a sandy intrasparite or a clay biopermicrite because that's also given us some special information in terms of deposit environment and eventually in terms of polar climate. Right, let's move on to the second classification system, the Dunham system, that I'm using most of the time for my research. Um, I feel this is an easier classification scheme. Um, it's providing different information, but still very valuable information in terms of depositional texture, hence depositional environment as well. We will consider two aspects of texture, the type and the amount of packing of the grains, and the relative abundance of grains to micrite, and finally, and, and second, the depositional binding of the grains. The Dunham boundary between grain-supported and mud-supported limestones is not based on a fixed grain to micrite ratios. This is more of a qualitative boundary than a quantitative boundary. I know this is, this might sound a bit weird, but remember that if we have a hand specimen, we look, we, or if we have a thin section, we have a 2D view of an object that is a 3D object. So the view of the sample that we have within this thin section only accounts for maybe half of what's happening in the sample. So this moving boundary between grain and mud supported limestones in the Dunham system is here to account for the fact that sometimes we don't have access to the whole sample because, because we don't have a 3D view of the sample. The classification stresses the, rela the relative abundance of alkanes and micrite. Yes, this is true. We'll see that in a minute. Um, it does not consider the identity of different kinds of carbonate grains. We don't need to recognize the alkanes for to apply the Dunham classification. And this is why I think this is a system that is easier to use while in the field. So this is what the Dunham system looks like. We have four main names that you need to remember this semester, mudstone, waxstone, and packstone, and grainstone. So from left to right, you can see that the amount of alchems increases, and between packstone and grainstone that have the same packing, what's in between the grain changes. For packstone, we have a micrite. For a grainstone, we don't have mud anymore, we don't have matrix anymore, we only have cement. So in more details, mudstone correspond to a mud-supported carbonate rock where we will find less than 10% of grains. If we can quantify, we can estimate that we have more than 10% of grain in the sample. And if uh, we still have a mud-supported texture, in other words, if the grains are still floating in a mud, we will have what's called a wacky stone. If we still have a mud, but if the grains start to be touching each other, if we have a grain-supported texture, then we have a pack stone. But we still have mud between the grain. We can have mud and cement, but as long as we have some mud, this is a pack stone. We really need to have no mud, but a grain-supported 
and the cement between the grains to call a sample a grain stone. This is very important because a grain stone is telling us that the energy in the environment of deposition was high and constant so that the fine particles that are making up the mud are washed away. If we have a rock that has been formed thanks to biological activity, then we will call that a bound stone. And there are more detailed terms if we can identify what, what kind of organisms. We won't use those terms this semester, but feel free to look them up in a paper that I linked at the end of this slide of this PowerPoint presentation that is stored, that is stored in Blackboard. Right, so some examples of allochemes, starting with intraclast, since this is the first one that I listed on my um, third slide, if I remember correctly. So that's, in, that's a thin section, uh, plant polarized light, PPL. Uh, the scale bar here and here is one millimeter. And here, uh, with uh, at the tip of these arrows, we have what's called intraclass. So these are pieces of rocks that have that has that have been um, semi-lithified and reworked and recycled within the sediment without or without transport or very short distance. Uh, short distance transport, meaning that um, what's inside the intraclast should look the same as the overall rock. However, the edges of the intraclast should be uh, pretty well defined. You can see this one here. The boundary of this dark intraclast are pretty edgy, pretty sharp. Um, we can see intraclast as a, at a larger scale, at the scale of an outcrop here. Uh, this is probably what I would call a rip-up clast, meaning that we have layers of, most of the time, muddy um, material that have been semi-lithified and as a, thanks to a storm even, for instance, those cohesive pieces of sediments are washed away, reworked and recycled in a rock. Um, this is another example of intraclast here. Uh, that is very well rounded, and you can see all around the intraclass we have oohits. In between the grains, yellow camps, we can't see mud. We can see the light going through the thin section. This is a cement that would be probably um, a new, uh, sorry, a new uh, spirite here. Uh, other kind of intraclass here. Um, this is a thin section that has been stained with blue epoxy, uh, which is great because anything that is blue in this picture is the porosity, is pore space, um, volume that is still available for the storage of fluid, hydrocarbon, water, name it. Uh, so this is a, this is a pretty cool um, thin section uh, with benthic foraminifera here. Uh, maybe some algae and this intraclast. Right, ooids, uh, you may know them already. They correspond to grains that have two parts. Uh, if I look at this one, there is a central part called the nucleus, and around the grain, the, the nucleus, sorry, a cortex that is made of very thin, very fine lamination that are concentric, that are going around the grain, shaping the shape uh, of the nucleus, basically. Um, these are pretty well-developed ooids. There are several laminations, but some ooids can only have one for uh, lamination. Here again, if I look what's bet in between the ooids, um, I can see the light going through um, whatever is in the pore space. I can also see some needles here that corresponds to cement. So that would be a very nice ooze pyrite. To the contrary here, we still have ooids. Eventually we have some lumps that would correspond eventually to um, intraclass or aggregate grains. But this time, between the grains, if I look very closely, as I have some voids, some pore space, um, through which the light of the microscope goes, meaning that this is probably cement, but there are also some pore space where the light doesn't go through. This is probably because there is some matrix. So that would probably be called a paxton. Moving on to the next type of allochem pellets. Those correspond to 
pretty tiny uh, grains. The scale here is one millimeter, so they are tinier than Uwitz. They don't have a very well defined um, internal structure. There's no nucleus. There is no nucleus, no cortex. This is, uh, think about a little uh, particle of mud that has been rounded. That would be your pellet. Um, the, the origin of pellet um, is variable. It could be a piece of mud that has been um, rounded because of the action of current. Uh, it can be a, a fossilized a poop as well. It can be a piece of bivalve that has been rounded during uh, and diagenesis. Many different origins that we will review in lecture. Um, this feature here is very interesting. You can see how this pellet and this one as well are impressing, are pushing into this larger one. This is probably because at the time of compaction, this pellet was not yet hard enough to um, support uh, the compaction and the pressure. So there is some uh, pr pressure here uh, accommodated by a, lo a loss of volume. Moving on to fossils, starting with uh, corals that are uh, very important in carbonate rocks because they are indicative of very specific deposition environment. Reefs, for instance, shell marine seas, um, if you've taken paleontology, you can easily recognize, especially in that microphotograph, the scale here is one millimeter, um, a colony of sc scleractinian, sorry, corals. Uh, this is another type of uh, rugose coral, this time uh, that is a solitary. Foraminifera are unicellular organisms um, that are building um, an exoskeleton called a test. Their size, their shape varies. We have, some, we can find some very tiny foraminifera. Uh, those ones, for instance, would measure, there's no scale bar, uh, but if, if I would estimate, I would say that could be 50 to 100 micron. Uh, look at those ones. Those are fusulinids from the Paleozoic, and this is a, qu a quarter for the scale. Those are large. Um, I've seen some benthic foraminifera from the Cenomanian, so cre early, early crete late Cretaceous, sorry, that, are, that were that big. Um, I've seen others that were that big from the Paleocene of um, Tunisia, uh, Numulite. Um, this is an example of a furzolinid, so this is a thin section, sorry, this is a cross section in a thin section of this type of forum. So you can see this is a fairly complicated organization of this test, and this is this organization that helps micropalontologists to identify and give a name to those specimens. Moving on, bryozoan. Uh, this is another type of colonial organisms. Uh, they can form some uh, branches, some leaves. They can encrust into a substratum. Uh, the internal uh, organization is fairly uh, diagnostic and easy to recognize and mimics the uh, macro organization of the colony. Um, this is another type of alchem of fossil that is indicate a specific deposition environment because there are, there are suspension feeders, they are living, they are feeding from suspensions into the water column, so uh, they like muddy water, rich in nutrients and rich in mi microalgae. Echinoderms as a no are another type of suspension feeders. Here we have an example of crinoids that were living encroached on the substratum uh, with a holdfast and then uh, a stem like this one that is made of little plate and each of those plates corresponds to one crystal of calcite. You can see in this one in the center there is a hole and this is where the living part of the crinoid was um, um, host. Um, in thin section this is, this is an example of a crinoid um, fragment here and here. You can see in the center this black portion where my laser pointer is. I'm moving it now. This is the central part of the crinoid. Another diagnostic criteria is the mesh structure of the, of the, of the crinoid remains. Sorry. 
And finally, because they, they are made by one single crystal of calcite, if I would switch to XPL and rotate the plate, um, the crown remain will extinct in one time, basically. So that's those three things, the central hole, the mesh structure, and the extinction pattern are the three main diagnostic uh, criteria for crinoids. I highlighted here this line, okay, uh, with crest, with trough. This is stylolite. This is something that developed during diagenesis, during burial at depth, starting 400 meters and up to six, 1,000 meters. This is a result of pressure solution. As burial increases, the pressure at the contact between grains increases. At some point, the pressure can't be accommodated anymore by rearrangement of the grains, and instead the grains will uh, experience dissolution. Hence, uh, the stylolite. All right, gastropods, snails. Um, I'm not going to I'm going to spend too much time on this slide. This is one example. Here we can see the columella here in the center and a pretty thin uh, shell. Uh, same again here, the columella and here the central shell. This one exhibits uh, a lot of dissolution, a lot of recrystallization. Um, most of the gastropods, if not all of them, um, precipitate their shells in aragonite. Aragonite is metastable and after the death of the organism of the snail, the shell will experience a phase of dissolution and recrystallization in low magnesium calcite. And this is happening very quickly during early diagenesis. This is why in this example I can see the, the edges of the shells, okay, highlighted by um, a very very thin layer of micrite, but the inside of the shell lack any primary texture. Instead, we have a spirite that has been uh, crystallized during early diagenesis. Right, ostracods, uh, kind of uh, sorry, some kind of arthropod. Um, we can recognize them because of this very diagnostic articulation here, and uh, the uh, at the other end, those very edgy. Um, uh, end of uh, the, the, the valves. Um, Ostracos are indicative of fairly brackish environments, uh, pretty common in shallow marine to um, lacustrine, palustrine environment. Uh, here in this example, another, uh, another ostracod uh, associated with a planktonic foraminifera here uh, and in the waxstone to paxstone. Waxstone to paxstone because here uh, if I would only look at that, I would say the alokens are not in contact. But now if I look here, uh, it's more of a grain supported. So uh, the dome classification allows us to have this kind of leniency where within the same thin section, the texture varies a bit. Right, we're moving slowly but surely into the realm of diagenesis. So diagenesis um, is anything that happens after the deposition of the sediments, um, any kind of cementation, dissolution, compaction. And dolomite falls into diagenesis. Most of the dolomite will be crystallized during diagenesis, especially if we see this kind of dolomitic realms um, that can grow within the porosity um, at very shallow depth, but also at um, deeper depth. Um, the deeper the crystallization occurs, the bigger the, the crystal of dolomite. Um, this one starts to be fairly big. Uh, diagnostic crit criteria, uh, high relief, um, birefringent color, not as bright as for calcite in XPL. And um, I must add, for instance, uh, if we look at this ROM here, the core um, is dark. This is another uh, diagnostic criteria for dolomite. All right, and I'm going to end with a bit of diagenesis and more specifically to what's happening to carnet rocks when they experience an, um, a fair amount of burial. So we're looking at depth once again between two, four hundred and deeper than that. 
as we increase the depth, the pressure of the lithological column above the sediment increases, right? So uh, the grains will start to get rearranged as, as long as they can move, but at some point they will get blocked, maybe because there's no room for them to move or because cement prevents any movement anymore. So when that starts to happen, the pressure will be localized at the contact between grains. And we will start to see this kind of feature. If a grain is stronger than the other one, it will push into the weaker grain, creating this kind of, I'm going to call that imbrication. Um, I, I don't have better word to describe that. Um, well, the proper term, sorry, would be a concavo convex contact. Um, if we keep on increasing the pressure, I already mentioned them, we would have stylolite. So here there is a very nice example of stylolite. And you can see how this poor oid here is not entirely preserved. I can see maybe 70% of it, I'm missing the rest of it. It means that maybe 70, uh, sorry, maybe 30 to 40% of the oid disappeared through pressure solution. You may ask me, okay, so what's happening to that material that disappeared? Well, the ion, the, 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 the calcite that is dissolved is going to produce ions, calcite and car um, calcium, sorry, and carbonates. Those ions will get into solution in a brine that will travel into the pores and eventually precipitate cement somewhere else, wherever there will be pore. That's an example here of a cement uh, in pink that developed around this piece of crinoid, and that's what we would call a syntaxial cement that is crystallizing, um, following and using the uh, lattice of this crinoid remain. The red arrow here or here highlights some other of those concave or convex um, contact, whereas in this slide we have, I believe, another stylolite that affects those large uh, benthic foraminifera, uh, disclosed cynids, I believe, um, that are uh, paleo um, cenozoic in age. Right. More resources. This is really for your own curiosity. Um, there is a paper that I'm going to store in Blackboard that synthesized the recent advancement in carbon classification. Um, so, for instance, if you want to know more about those um, terms, dynamic ter terms applied to bioconstruction. You can find them into this paper. If you want to see more microphotographs, look up this website. This is a beautiful website uh, sponsored by the International Association of Sedimentologists that gathers a lot of microphotographs. They are organized in type of allochems as well as on type of diagenetic uh, processes, if I remember correctly. The link the links will be in the PDF of that lecture as well as single links into Blackboard in the folder for this lab. All right, you have an assignment for next week. Um, it will be due in a week from now at 5 p.m. You have a series of scanned thin sections that are stored into the folder for this lab. You have a Word document that you can use to answer questions on specific sample. For instance, here, the first question is about sample TS-19. So you have to find that file and look at the scan of that thin section and look for this type of alchem. This is a benthic forum um, and make a sketch of that, um, of that alchem. And there are several types of questions. There are also some exercises related to the classification. You also have uh, several hand specimens in your sample box that you, you retrieve from us, um, from campus. We are asking you to find them, identify them, and sketch them and classify them using the Dunham classification. As always, if you have any question related to that lab or something else, please feel free to join either Matthew or myself during our, our office hours. If you can't make it to our office hours, send us an email and we will come back to you as soon as we can and we will help you the best we can. Thank you very much.